restrictions um, had seriously undermined the system's integrity. When I say insulation from political influence, I mean of the humane sort, intervention to make the rich richer or bail them out when they hit a wall. I was okay, encouraged in fact. The competence of the state, military and political functions, aside, uh, police functions aside were consciously eroded. Public investment was squeezed and our physical and social infrastructure left to rot. Class and racial disparities in health widened along with income inequality and economic precarity. Debt levels kept rising and the cult of maximizing stock prices meant corporations didn't invest or hire. Many borrowed money just to buy their own stock to raise its price, leaving them in weak financial shape when this crisis hit. This economic crisis is different from both sorts that I've been describing. It's not the garden variety recession of post-World War II decades, nor is it like the financial crises of the neoliberal era. It's the result of mass illness disrupt disrupting normal economic life, making it difficult for people to go to work, although of course many have been forced to at great peril, or to shop or to do all the things that keep the, war, uh, the world, uh, the wheels of consumption and production spinning. But the crisis hit a system that had been structurally weakened because of that systemic rot, that erosion of state capacity, declining health among a lot of the population, increasing financial fragility, inequality, precarity, and all the rest. Fragility and precarity are widespread, even in what are nominally good times. According to an, economic, uh, to an annual survey of economic well-being done by the Federal Reserve, an institution that ironically shows more interest in the topic than most others in US society, in October 2019, when the unemployment rate was under 4%, 16% of adults were un unable to pay their monthly bills in full, and another 12% so they couldn't pay if they were hit with an unexpected $400 expense. A November survey by the Census Bureau shows over a third of households struggling to pay their bills. Although these surveys aren't comparable, the results suggest um, a substantial increase in inability to get by from an already scandalously high number. Over a third of the public couldn't meet an unexpected $400 expense either out of savings or using a credit card they'd pay off at the end of the month. The rest would either carry a credit card balance or throw up their hands in despair. One in four skipped medical or dental care because they couldn't afford it. Almost one in five had unpaid medical debt. Now those are averages. It will not surprise you to learn that white people did better than average and black and Latino people did worse. For example, about four and five white people were doing okay or living comfortably compared with about two or three black and Latin, Latino people. You could turn that around though, even in a relatively good year, one in five white people were barely getting by. Almost four or five, almost four and five straight people, I was surprised the Fed asked this question, were doing at least okay, comparing with two and three identifying as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. And again, that one, or, one out of three were not getting by very well. So that was the situation going into this hellscape. In November, the official unemployment rate was 6.7%, well above where it was when the Fed took that survey uh, a bit over a year ago. Unemployment has come down from a peak of almost 15% in April as people were recalled to work, but that 6.7% is higher than three quarters of the month since 1950. Under this definition of unemployment, you have to have looked for work in the previous month. If you broaden the definition to include people who've given up the job search as hopeless and to include those who are working part-time but want to work full-time, the unemployment rate was 12%, also down from April's peak, but still at recession levels despite this partial recovery. And it looks like that recovery is running out of steam. While the number of people applying for unemployment insurance benefits is down from its spring peak, nearly three quarters of a million people a week are still signing up in traditional state programs. Almost 15 million people are collect collecting benefits. Just over half of those beneficiaries are on the roll, on the rolls because of an expansion of eligibility to freelancers and others who would not have been eligible under traditional programs. That expansion of unemployment insurance eligibility was part of the first pandemic re relief package, the so-called CARES Act. That program uh, expires in a couple of weeks. The CARES Act also included a $600 weekly benefit on top of normal state benefits, but that expansion expired in July. So they're back in the regular program. And many are actually running out of their benefits because uh, most states don't let you go out past 26 weeks and we're 26 weeks, well over 26 weeks since the onset of this crisis. Benefits uh, vary widely by state, ranging from 550 a week in Massachusetts to $215 a week in Mississippi. 
most southern states pay well under $300 a week in unemployment benefits. The national average pre-supplement was 342. So that $600 supplement made a huge difference to millions of people, but it is no longer. And soon the benefits for freelancers and others traditionally excluded from the programs will expire. The unemployment insurance provisions of the CARES Act were probably the most generous, generous welfare state measures in our very ungenerous national history. Job losses from late March onward resulted in steep declines in wage and salary income, almost twice as bad as the declines after the 2008 financial crisis, and were exceeded only by the onset of the Great Depression in the early 1930s. But those declines were more than offset by the huge increase in unemployment insurance benefits, along with those now largely forgotten $1,200 stimulus checks. Those payments were so large that personal income actually rose overall, despite that giant hit to wage and salary income. Personal consumption spending collapsed in late March and early April, but stabilized almost the very day the CARES Act passed and began rising when the payments started flowing. With those programs now expired or almost expired, the number of people struggling to get by is increasing by millions. These numbers, of course, are aggregates. Lots of people almost certainly haven't been so lucky. Many reported huge difficulties in filing for unemployment insurance because our systems are so antiquated. As a quarter of, as a quarter of benefits went paid, uh, sorry, about a quarter of benefits went unpaid in the early months of the crisis because of bottlenecks in the system. Uh, some of these uh, state unemployment insurance systems are uh, date to the 1960s and were written in the language, the computer language COBOL, which almost nobody knows anymore and has a hard time updating. Despite those payments, uh, food banks were doing record business and they're doing even more of a record business now that many of those payments have expired. According to the Census Bureau, there's been a decline of 47 million people in the number reporting that they're getting enough of the food that they want. Most are getting enough food, just not what they want, but about 6 million don't have enough to eat at least some of the time. It's worth reporting that, pointing out that just before the pandemic, just over 8% of people said they weren't getting enough to eat much, much or most of the time which is a scandalous number, a scandalous number in a country as rich as this one. But uh, now that number is up to about 12%. So there's no question those supplemental benefits helped a lot, but no longer. There will probably be some kind of second relief bill, but the two parties are still a part of the details when the Republicans are divided among themselves. The Republican attitude was captured by Treasury Secretary Steve Mnuchin, who said a few months ago, we're going to make sure that we don't pay people more money to stay home than go to work can't have that. As I said earlier, that job market recovery, which we saw uh, is uh, coming out of the spring, is now running out of steam. We lost 22 million jobs in March and April and have recovered just over 12 million of them, or about 56%. There was a burst of growth in May and especially June, but since then, each subsequent month has shown a smaller positive number. What looks to be happening is that the easy recalls after the initial shutdowns have happened, and with the giant stimulus of the CARES Act receding, there's not much fuel for more. It would not be a surprise to see some minus signs starting early next year as sickness and death continue their march across our great land. Despite that recovery, employment in November was still 6.4% below February's. That would qualify as a savage recession in itself. At the low point of the 2008-2009 recession, which actually occurred in early 2010, so uh, delayed and, and, and weak was a recovery, employment then was 6.3% off its peak. So despite the recovery, we're still worse off than we were after the worst recession of modern times. Public employment has continued to decline with state and local government education in the lead, and yet the state and local fiscal crisis have yet to bite seriously. How long could this recession last? I'm actually not sure whether recession, a word of a business cycle theory, is appropriate to what looks like more like a structural crisis. It's one caused by immense damage to the real sector, supply chains broken, workers kept off the job by sickness and death, and the fear of sickness and death. Firms bankrupted by months of closure who may never reopen or rehire. The Fed can pump money into the markets and the federal government can deficit spend on a previously unimaginable scale. And the spending in the, scale, uh, the CARES Act really was quite, um, quite large, about 10% of GDP but these problems will take time to heal. And we never really recovered from the 2008 crisis going into this one. That one led to a serious long-term economic damage. Had the economy continued to grow in line with this 1970 to 2007 trend, 
GDP would be about 20% higher than it was than it is now. GDP is a deeply flawed measure. It says little about distribution or the quality of life, but it is what the capitalist system runs on. Listen to any pundit or propagandist and growth is what the whole setup is all about. And by this most conventional of measures, American capitalism is failing badly on its own terms. But the stock market, oh, that stock market keeps making new highs. So why with all this economic gloom around? I can see at least four reasons. One, the financial market's reputation for rationality is thoroughly unearned. The markets are populated by traders with the emotional volatility of 14-year-old boys. I actually have a 14-year-old son and he's far more stable than most stock traders. Second, the markets have been convinced the virus is going to go away soon and everything will be better very soon. That, uh, that kind of thinking has been encouraged by uh, the development of vaccines, uh, although uh, we're a long way from them with actually being in actual people yet. The bounce back was supposed to begin in the second half of uh, 2020. Well, we're not, uh, we're not there in any significant way yet. And so maybe we're gonna have to postpone that till 2021. Third, the Federal Reserve has been pumping trillions into the markets for months. That's potent fuel for a speculative fire. And it's not just they pump money in. Uh, a couple of uh, studies have shown that whenever the Fed just issues a reassuring word, the stock market rallies. The Fed has made it clear that it will not tolerate any kind of serious implosion, and uh, the markets are very happy every time that's remi they're reminded of that. And fourth, most of the market's gains have been concentrated in big tech stocks like Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, and Google, or in the pandemic plays like Zoom, and uh, I guess Slack is now. Uh, uh, been taken over, but uh, it, was, it was hot for a little while too. And then there's Tesla, which has now capitalized at more than the five biggest automakers combined, even though the company sells fewer vehicles in a year than Toyota does in a month. So to ask Lenin's quest, classic question, what is to be done? Most urgently, people need serious income support, at least 2,000 a month for six months. We need eviction and foreclosure moratoriums to prevent what looks like an impending wave of mass homelessness. State and local governments need school systems. Uh, state and local governments and school systems need big support, as do colleges and universities and transit systems. If they don't get it, there will be massive jobs and service cuts that will generate uh, misery and deeper depression. Longer term never has been the Green New Deal a longer term, never has the Green New Deal seemed so practical, Nancy Pelosi's green dream or whatever dismissal to the contrary. It has everything we need, a massive public investment program to repair our rotting infrastructure and the kinds of social spending we need to make the poor not, the poor, not poor and the working and middle classes comfortable and secure. For decades, civilian public investment net of depreciation has hovered just above zero, meaning that we're doing little better than replacing things as they decay. This economic statistics can easily be confirmed just by walking around anywhere in the US outside our fanciest neighborhoods. We need massive investment in public infrastructure on the model of the New Deal, both to fight the slump and to make the country habitable for the bottom 80 to 90% of the population. The infrastructure investment must not simply be more of the same, not just airports and highways, but clean energy and high speed rail. The investment program needs to be part of a conversion of an economy based on exploitation of workers and nature into something humane and sustainable. The New Deal also subsidized artists and writers and the projects it created were often beautiful, not driven by the mean Philistine view of life that we usually associate with the public sector in this country. As an example of the new kind of investment we need, we want to get now unemployed auto workers back to building vehicles that don't threaten life on earth. A model to think about was to think about was a, proposed, a proposal to transform a plant in Ontario that GM closed into something that would make earth and worker friendly vehicles. We also need to think about industries we, do, we don't want to see recover. The airline industry, um, despite some recovery in recent months is still in dire shape, but it's also ecologically destructive. And we need to imagine a world in which we continue to, we, well, in which we continue to fly much less. Traffic is down 60 to 70% uh, from uh, year to year. And uh, we need a lot more of that. The cruise industry is filthy and wrecks the towns where its giant ships dock, and it should be euthanized. This would be a propitious time to nationalize the oil and gas sector, undertaken with the idea 
of putting them out of business. Uh, it's actually an article on the front page of the Financial Times today reporting that uh, several people who are involved in Shell's attempt to reinvent itself as a greener enterprise have left because the oil and gas industry is never going to, can never be trusted to reinvent itself as a greener enterprise. We must uh, move as quickly as possible to stop the use of fossil fuels. And as long as these companies exist, the political and economic obstacles to that necessity are nearly impossible to overcome. Because the price of oil has fallen so dramatically, the value of the major carbon producers has fallen dramatically as well. The five biggest US-based oil companies, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Phillips 66, and Valero, have a combined market capitalization of about $400 billion, which is equal to about an eighth of JP Morgan Chase's total assets and less than 2% of GDP. It's another way of saying we could afford this nationalization quite easily. Shareholders would whine, but as the financial world wakes up to the inevitability of carbon's obsolescence, the value of these investments will tend towards zero anyway. The banking system is in decent shape now, surprisingly perhaps, but should this recession continue, that will change as more people and businesses um, run into debt trouble. Uh, businesses in particular have, uh, while households were prudent going into this crisis and had been reducing their debt levels for the decades after the financial crisis, uh, businesses have not. They borrowed like crazy and now the biz uh, non-financial businesses have the highest uh, ratio of, of debt to GDP they have ever had by a long shot. We could nationalize several of the largest, largest banks and not with the idea of returning them to private ownership, but uh, instead running them on entirely different principles, something like a financial utility, one that provides, the base, provides basic services like checking and savings accounts, but not incomprehensible financial products. There's no reason that those nationalized banks couldn't be run to finance a Green New Deal. Some of that Green New Deal would have to be financed with traditional tax and bond finance public spending, but there's no reason that socialized banks couldn't participate. And along with those nationalized banks, we could create something on the model of the Reconstruction Finance Corporation to finance the Green New Deal. It would be a publicly capitalized bank that would reevaluate and fund projects like clean energy generation and new models of food production. During World War II, uh, the US government pretty much took over the entire manufacturing sector and uh, the climate crisis is certainly a crisis on a scale of a world war and we shouldn't think about doing the same again. At the, at the same time, we should severe, severely rein in with an eye to abolishing the shadow backing sector of private equity and hedge funds. Private equity has saddled companies with crippling levels of debt, which enrich their investors and put them at great risk of failure, even in relatively good times. And hedge funds do little but destabilize markets, moving in and out of them, uh, leaving a lot of damage in their wake. And never has the need for Medicare for all been so clear. And the reason for that isn't just the need of freeing people from the anxiety of, being able, uh, being, of not being able to pay for essential care, but there's also little in the way of planning for the distribution of healthcare resources beyond what the market demands. A major part, part of the reason the US has been so <clears throat> unprepared to handle the coronavirus crisis is that hospitals are built and outfitted according to where the money is, not where the needs are. Uh, it's better to get, uh, it's easier to get plastic surgery from paying patients than it is to handle the basic needs of poor people in poor neighborhoods. Hospitals in both cities and rural areas are broke and closing in the middle of a health emergency. They need to be built where they can serve people who need them. Now, all this may seem pie in the sky, but whoever thought there would be a socialist caucus in the New York State Legislature or that Alexander Ocasio-Cortez would be such a national or international celebrity. The right has, uh, still has political power, even after Trump's loss, but it's a widely discredited, uh, discredited formation in a lot of eyes. And mainstream Democrats are demonstrating themselves to be completely out of ideas. We're, in a deep, mass, deep, we're deep in a massive economic and social crisis, and we on the left have the energy and ideas, and they don't. Now is not the time to be shy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Doug. Uh, just, uh, I wanna apologize because I was supposed to uh, record the event from the beginning and I hope that the lecturer uh, doesn't, uh, is okay with that. Uh, but I, so I started in the middle after he, uh, he had already- Okay, well, you know, it's not one for the ages. <laughs> but but, but I, I would appreciate it if, if you could uh, send us your, the full transcript and we could, oh, yeah. you know, in, on the YouTube, uh, <clears throat> 
you know. Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, let's open the now the floor for questions and answers, the Zoom floor. Uh, you will have to have your, your camera open so that I can see if you raise your hand or else you can, uh, you're gonna have to gesture or use the chat, okay? This is the time to ask questions. Uh, uh, Dr. Tabrisi, go right ahead. Uh, you need to unmute. Oh, let me unmute you on my screen. Yeah. It is, I think. Yeah, I think it is working now, right? I can hear you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So how do you define recession? Because you had some doubt that we are in recession. I mean, by definition that we define in economics that back to back to uh, six months, at least we have to be, you know, uh, reduction in GDP. So only then we get into recession. That part, you know, I joined a little late because I had problem with uh, signing in. Uh, I heard you that you had little doubt about uh, that we are in recession by definition. Well, let me say a couple of things about that. One is, you know, that's that two quarter uh, decline in GDP is not really an official definition. It's whatever the business cycle uh, dating committee of the NBER says it is. And they declared the recession began in December. We uh, had a very negative second quarter, but then we had a big recovery in, in, in the third. So um, by, by that, you know, the two quarter rule of thumb, we don't, we're not even in the formal recession, although of course, <laughs> with unemployment still 12 million off its peak, it's kind of hard to say we're having great times. But I think what I'm trying to point out is that it's not really a business cycle phenomenon. We have, you know, deep, deep structural problems. Uh, there was the disease, of course, but, um, there was also um, you know, all the fissures that have been revealed uh, by this um, uh, by this crisis. Um, the vast disparities in the way people, poor people, have uh, been doing, uh, working class people have been doing, and the way the rich have been doing. I mean, it's just phenomenal that in the midst of this economic crisis, the uh, the stock market has been going higher, and uh, Jeff Bezos's personal wealth has passed two hundred billion dollars, and uh, you know, the Elon Musk is just rolling in. And all these characters are getting richer and richer, and the stock market is frothing, and all these deals are being done. Um, we're seeing a. It's interesting. We're seeing a whole bunch of, uh, of these uh, these so called unicorns, these private uh, startups. Now going public, which makes me think that maybe the smart money thinks that things are getting a little frothy and they want to cash in on it. But it's just amazing to see the financial markets and the rich doing so well while everyone else is doing rather poorly. But we've also seen, you know, some people, professional class people have been working at home. They haven't really experienced much of a hit to their incomes. Although uh, they're, they're certainly experiencing a lot of problems with childcare and in many cases, especially women. But um, the... People, uh, there's just still a massive amount of unemployment in a whole lot of industries. Uh, the the the, uh, the restaurant industry in New York is in deep crisis, and that's employed a lot of people. Uh, and with so many uh, of these businesses shutting, I think you're going to see a lot of. We're already seeing, but we're going to see more of it. Uh, restaurants and small retail establishments closing. Uh, it's not going to be easy to recall people to work if the employers just don't exist anymore. Um, so I think the combination of, you know, all the fissures that this revealed um, and um, the, the, the fact that there's been all these disruptions to the real sector and business failures, um, that um, it just seems like much more of a structural crisis uh, than it seems like, you know, kind of business cycle recession. That's why, I, I, you know, I guess you could technically say it's in many ways it is a recession, but it also there's just something it seems much more fundamental than just, you know, an Arthur Burns business cycle kind of thing. Yeah, may I say something? Then how it can be, how it can be corrected? Because we have here a kind of puzzle. If we shut down, so we have this problem that you are saying. If we don't, then we have the health crisis. So how do you think that it should be managed to make a balance between this so that we can, uh, you know, go through this structural problem? Well, you know, the um, like I said, the initial CARES Act did a pretty good job. It got lots of money in people's pockets, but it uh, was too little and then expired. Um, and we need more of that. Uh, other countries have been, I believe Canada's 
offering like $2,000 a month to a lot of people. A lot of European countries have been offering money to a lot of people. Um, so they haven't experienced the same kind of uh, broad economic crisis that we have. Um, and you know, aside from you know, the economic usefulness of, of these the kind of stimulus payments, it's just the, the human cost of not having that kind of support has been very, very great. You know, we're seeing more people uh, at the risk of, of for not so much foreclosure, homeowners are doing more or less okay, but renters are, 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 are looking, um, to, a lot of renters are in trouble. Um, and uh, um, uh, we see a lot of you know people having, having not, not, not enough to eat, you know, people lining up for miles uh, in, in their cars at food banks, uh, inability to get health care, you know, all these things. If we had a civilized welfare state and a serious public investment program with uh, decent uh, income supports, that would really mitigate this uh, substantially. But, uh, you know, I think uh, Democrats were pushing uh, for somewhat more generous uh, relief package. Um, the Republicans have blocked that at every turn. It looks like we're going to get some kind of compromise with maybe another $600 payment but the uh, Republicans don't want to uh, do anything to uh, assist state and local governments who are in deep, deep trouble. Um, so it just, as long as Mitch McConnell is, holds the keys to the kingdom, we're not going to get anything of the sort that we need. Um, the Democrats were fighting for something better, but you know, certainly not, um, not serious social democracy, Absolutely. but that's the kind of thing we need. You know, public investment and income support is what we need. And for the long term, not just, uh, not just uh, through the crisis, but we really need to think about restructuring this uh, whole um, society for um, an, an important, more humane fashion for the long term. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I have a couple of questions um, uh, from uh, Dr. Julio Matos. Uh, Doug, uh, what are the perspectives for the new Biden administration? Should we have hope of something positive in the near future? That's one question. And, uh, and the other one is by a student, uh, Thierry Val. Does he think, uh, do you think that Zoom, Tesla will stay on the level that they are now for a long time? Uh, and uh, my- I, 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 I didn't hear that second question. But, uh, well, the question is if, if you if, uh, kind of put in your head as a financial analyst, do you think that Tesla and Zoom <laughs> in, the, in the high heavens, uh, and my my question is: Would you would you be uh, would you dare to elaborate just a, a quick improvised uh, uh, analysis on the uh, international implications of the the current disorder? Yeah, let me see if I can remember all those three things. Uh, let me start with the um, the stock uh, question first, because okay. uh, uh, well, it's funny to see. Um, uh, the moods of the markets shifting um, every time there was a vaccine development. So they would uh, you know, sell Zoom and buy airlines. That was what the, the, the instinctive reaction of the, uh, the, 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 the stock market was whenever there was a good development in the vaccine front. Um, I don't know. I think, I think everyone in the world is so sick of Zoom um, that uh, it may be that once we can go back into public again, that... Uh, People will uh, avoid the thing uh, with an almost phobic sense of um, anxiety and disgust. Um, Tesla, I, the whole Tesla thing is absolutely insane. I mean, it's just uh, the valuations and thing, it's up like 600% in a year or something like that. They, like I said, they sell fewer cars in a year than Toyota does in a month, uh, yet the valuation is you know, many times the combined valuations of, of, of the major car companies. I can't believe that this stuff is going to continue. Uh, we're also seeing this frenzy of deal making. Um, uh, um, venture capitalists throwing all kinds of money into startups. Uh, we, you know, we saw that over the last several years, but uh, you, it, it's continued. It, it, if anything, accelerated in recent months. Uh, some really crazy deals being done. Um, and there was an article in the New York Times yesterday, or today, by Aaron Griffith, who's a great reporter on these things, and also has a great sense of humor. Um, just you know, they, uh, one company had uh, just secured one funding round and got a call uh, from somebody else who said, "Oh, I want to wire you more money this afternoon." So you know, that's they're just you know, people are lining up for miles to get food, and these ridiculous startups are just getting showered with money. It's just I, the, the sickness of this. You know, it's just appalling. I try to maintain you know some degree of critical distance, but you know, the the the, the, the it's just revolting. Um, to watch this kind of uh, inequality you, uh, on such a grand scale. Are you suggesting that the financial markets are not allocating uh, investment in the most socially 
beneficial way? I would, I would uh, more than suggest that. I would assert that aggressively. Um, but you know, I would not even clear that this makes capitalist sense in the long term. Some of these companies are so crackpot. You know, Uber, perfect example. Uber, um, uh, company that's almost ten years old and still hasn't made a dime, um, and shows no prospect of making money. Uh, but you know, they're just. They're rolling in it. I just don't. I really. It's just remarkable um, that uh, it seems like the the you would think the first imperative of capitalist society is to make a profit. Yet all these guys get funded who are not make profits. It's it's wild. Um, it just says something about <clears throat> the state of American capitalism right now. My friend Christian Parenti defines this as the uh, the necrotic stage of American capitalism. It's all about decay and rot. Uh, and uh, yeah, that seems to be uh, what it's all about. The um, uh, the Biden. Biden administration. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, some of the appointments are not so bad. Um, it, the um, appointments to the Council of Economic Advisors, uh, Jared Bernstein and Heather Boucher, whose nomination is running through a bit of trouble because of um, some issues about her style of, of management. But um, you know, these are good people with good politics. I used to know them from the Union for Radical Political Economics, um, and now uh, they're likely to be in the Council of Economic Advisors. And that's a funny time. Heather was my uh, my classmate in several. Oh yes, yes, you went to at the New School. Yeah, yeah. I used to hang out with a lot of those those folks then. Um, and um, Janet Yellen as Treasury Secretary could do worse, far worse than Janet Yellen. It's not you know some ghoul from BlackRock or something like that. Although there's somebody from BlackRock who's going to be a what uh, chief of staff or something i can't remember yeah what, what. It's, uh, under secretary of the treasury or something like that yeah and but now the international appointments you know the the it looks like you know just in, in terms of um, foreign policy and military policy it looks like biden wants to go back to the obama way of doing things you know uh there are a lot of a lot of concern that trump had destroyed it was undermining nato and so we're going to go back to nato and all these marvelous things um you know in, in, it's perverse, but in many ways, Trump did more to undermine the U.S. imperial structure than any <laughs> any president uh, ever has. And uh, now, of course, I think Biden wants to restore it. But in, you know, in, in terms of economic policy, Biden has said a lot of good things. He wants he's not for the Green New Deal, but he's for something like it. Uh, it looks like he's semi-serious about doing stuff on climate and public investment. Um, he claims that he's a friend of unions, and in a lot of ways, I think he probably. Um, coming from a different generation than Obama, he probably is instinctively uh, more pro-labor than Obama was. I think Obama always wanted to be the new kind of Democrat who was not you know, bogged down by all those association with unions. Um, so, you know, on, on that side, he seems to be somewhat better, but the problem is um, the Senate, you know, as long as Republicans control the Senate, almost nothing decent can get through that. You can do something with executive orders, uh, especially on the climate stuff, but if we want, you know, kinds of public investment programs and income support programs we need for the longer term and a remaking of the healthcare finance system. Um, I think what, um, uh, what's the thing, Bracera, Bracera the, um, the, the, the secretary designate for uh, health and human services said he's for a single payer system. I don't know um, if that's actually going to be, but uh, regardless of whether he's for it or not, um, there's no way that Mitch McConnell's Senate would ever pass it. And I just was seeing reminded of the quote that, uh, um, that McConnell uh, uh, uttered when Obama became president. He says, what we hope for Obama is that he's a one-term president and they're going to uh, do their best to make sure they're gonna repeat that strategy of obstruction and difficulty. And, uh, you know, the, and the fact that uh, the Democrats lost seats in the house um, is, um, well, I'm not sure exactly what that means, but it's, in part it's testimony to the fact that they um, don't have much in the way of a, a program that appeals to the broad public. Um, so I'm just worried that we're going to see if they're going to um, be disappointing uh, that Republican obstruction, they'll be blamed for Republican obstructionism, and then, you know, there'll be losses in the midterms, but you know, we're getting way ahead of ourselves here. We, we don't know, but, you know, there are some good things about Biden, um, I'll have to say. Um, and um, on the international side, God, I don't know. I mean, what's, what's happened? I, I really haven't been following. I've been kind of... Uh, um, inward looking, um, just focusing on the American crisis. Uh, uh, how about the, the, you know, the China? Uh, oh, well, China. <laughs> oh, yes. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, there's going to be a lot of, you know, Trump brought a special um, uh, visceral hatred of Chinese people to his attitude. Uh, 
uh, uh, towards the relations with China. Um, you know, he's obviously just a, a revolting xenophobe and racist. And the way you could even hear it in the way he pronounced the name China, 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 China. It was just, just repulsive to listen to him doing those things. But um, that, that aside, I mean, Trump's own personal obnoxiousness uh, aside, um, there is a growing rivalry between the US and China that uh, regardless of who's in power is going to um, um, react to. Uh, uh, and it's there, there's you know political and military threats to worry about, but also economic rivalry. Um, China is no longer you know the workshop of the world. It's not the low wage uh, assembler of products designed. You know it's the Apple um, Apple products. I would say you know designed in California, made in China. Um, uh, it, we're going to see more and more designed in China. There was the news the other day that they had developed a uh, some kind of supercomputing system um, that uh, was faster than Google's. Uh, so they're really um, you know, uh, become very advanced in, in science. Uh, they're making a lot of progress on climate more than us. Um, and or just you know, the, the Chinese ruling class is brutal, but they really are in control. They know what they're doing. And um, they, um, they seem to have a strategic plan that goes out centuries where we have a ruling class that is you know, very short-sighted, disorganized, and um, just motivated by the shortest term considerations. Um, so uh, yeah, that rivalry is gonna deepen and intensify. I just don't see anything um, um, pleasant coming out of that. And uh, there's an awful lot of um, really nasty anti-Chinese sentiment running around too. It just makes me very uncomfortable. I just don't like to see that, but uh, it's, uh, it's uh, you know, it affects the elite, but it also affects the broad population and that, that could end up um, getting kind of ugly. Thank you, thank you. Uh, there is a student, Malena Genova, um, asking uh, if you could, again, try to summarize the main takeaway of the lecture and, uh, and repeat the four points of why the stock market is doing well. Okay, well, <laughs> just, my, main, it just, my main takeaway is we're in deep trouble um, that uh, the, the disease brought out an awful lot of structural problems with the American economy, uh, the pandemic has brought out that, uh, you know, there's decades of underinvestment, and, uh, increasing precarity and, and, and maldistribution uh, and the erosion of our capacity to do anything good with, uh, for the state to do anything good. Um, all these things have gotten worse under Trump, but they've been developing for decades and um, the increasingly short-term um, orientation of uh, corporations um, is also um, uh, you know, the, 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 the use of heavily borrowing lots of money just to buy up their own stock to increase its prices left them uh, in fairly poor financial shape. Um, so I think, you know, this, this pandemic has brought out what are a lot of deep structural problems in the U.S. economy and society, uh, deep fissures by, you know, race and class and region um, and um, uh, there's uh, they're not going to go away easily uh, other countries that have not uh, experienced um, the profound kind of rot and and, and and polarization that we have are not you know, they're certainly having disease problems and you know the the, the virus doesn't necessarily respect social systems, but um, the uh, other countries are not doing quite so badly in the social dimensions as we are, because I think we've got all these festering problems that uh, are really coming to a head. Um, the, the reasons the stock market is doing well, um, it's the uh, Federal Reserve has been very indulgent. Um, stock traders are deeply optimistic people um, who just think that anything, any shred of good news is something to celebrate. Um, what else? I can't remember my other two points now at this point. Um, it, the vaccines. Uh, well, yeah, they, they, you know, they, they, they think that the, the, the virus is going to go away very quickly. Uh, and now the vaccine development is encouraging that belief, even though there's certainly a lot of bumps in the road between here and there. Um, and, uh, they're pumping it's up all that money the Fed put into the, to the markets. It's just, and, and the assurances that it comes along with, uh, these things have been, uh, great stimulants uh, to speculation. Plus, you know, there's just so much money at the high end um, between rich individuals and big institutions with money that more money than they know what to do with. Um, what, what do you do with all that money? Just buy stocks with it. Uh, we could feed people with it, but instead we just buy stocks with it. Well, just to continue to pick your brain, uh, two, two items that I wanted to bounce off you. Uh, number one, the, uh, the uh, Jason Foreman, uh, Larry Summers paper, 
Uh, I don't know if you had a chance to, to check it out. On no, I haven't. I've heard about it. Yeah. I need to. Okay. okay. Yeah. So they basically that that uh, uh, the the traditional uh, uh, debt uh, ratio to GDP um, is tendentious that we shouldn't use that as a measure of the fiscal condition of the federal government. That um, that actually there is room, ample room for. Um, for an aggressive fiscal expansion, um, that um, that oops, uh, Larry Summers, uh, uh, we were wrong. Uh, you know, in in 2008, you know, with Obama, uh, we were too tepid in our fiscal aspirations, and in retrospect, we can see that there is room for that. It's no like inflation is nowhere to be seen. That kind of thing. Uh, and uh, the other the other thing that I wanted also you to comment on is you had a chance to uh, to read if not Obama's uh, new book at least some uh, reviews of, of his book that can give you a sense of what this guy is up to. <laughs> um, yeah, it's funny, Larry Summers. Now you know, if only he told us then, <laughs> right? Because um, he's one of the people who thought that. Uh, who was it? Uh, Christina Romer, I think, wanted a uh, over a trillion dollar package, and you know, Summers and Rahm Emanuel said, "No, too big, too big. We can't do that." Um, and you know, that that stimulus uh, kept us from going down. I mean, you know, the, if, if if it had not been for that, uh, uh, what was it? Um, what was the official name of it? I can't remember now. But if it hadn't been for that stimulus package, uh, the economy would have utterly imploded. Um, but it it, it was. It expired too quickly. Um, within a year or so, uh, the government was tightening its budget. State and local governments were cutting budgets, so uh, they were offsetting any stimulus that was coming out of Washington. So by, I don't know, 2011 or so, uh, the government sector was actually a drag on economic growth. Uh, we had, uh, uh, so if, if, and as a result of that, we had um, an extremely slow recovery. Uh, the, the official, the recession officially ended in, uh, I think, June 2009, but we didn't see a bottom of employment for another uh, eight months or so. Um, and then the, the growth in employment was very slow at first. And the reason for that was all this austerity. And then, add, you know, not, it was not just the economic effects of austerity, but uh, the Centers for Disease Control uh, and, uh, you know, good things like that were starved for funds. Uh, state and local public health systems were starved for funds. So, when, you know, 10 years later, when we hit this great public health crisis, the agencies that are supposed to handle that sort of thing uh, were had been um, deeply underfed for a decade. Um, so, you know, if, if Larry Summers had uh, uh, said the right thing then, um, then uh, um, uh, we might not... Uh, have been in such trouble. But on the other hand, you know, if he's coming around now, welcome, Larry. Um, and uh, yeah, I, we uh, certainly have the capacity to borrow more, uh, spend more. Um, and uh, that's the only way we're going to get out of this is if we have a large public investment program. And you know, I don't think we can, you know, borrow uh, gobs of money indefinitely. Um, at some point, you could kind of run into some kind of financing constraint, but we're not there yet. And there's every reason to uh, be as um, uh, ambitious as possible right now. So yeah, I would agree with uh, Summers and Furman on that on that score. Um, <clears throat> I haven't read Obama's book. It's what like 750 pages, right? I think I have better things to do with my time. I'd rather read this new book about French country cooking that I just got. Um, but um, the uh, uh, from what I've read of it, um, he just you know he's in many ways such a disappointment. Because obviously there's a lot going on in his head. He's a very smart guy. He um, is very sophisticated, knows a lot, writes very well, but his instincts are basically deeply neoliberal and have been all along. Um, he strikes me as someone who um, you know, grew up under, well, you know, actually his background is curious. His mother worked for the Ford Foundation in Indonesia just after the coup, uh, the Suharto coup in Indonesia. The Ford Foundation was deeply involved in that coup. Um, they actually uh, supplied names of people to kill um, to um, the Indonesian government. So it always made me wonder what Obama's mother was doing with the Ford Foundation in uh, Indonesia uh, back in, what was it, 1965 or so. Um, but that aside, um, he is a guy who has been uh, groomed by elites uh, for most of his life. Um, and um, they can, obviously he has got a lot of 
talent, a lot of charisma, um, uh, had a lot of promise, and um, he um, really has done uh, very well for himself. Uh, he went about a year and a half, he's in the Senate for a year and a half. Uh, Harry Reid calls him into his office, says, you know, you're not really meant for the Senate, you should run for president. Um, we don't want, we're going to keep this secret because we don't want to alienate Hillary, but um, yeah, you should run for president. So Obama runs for president and wins, you know, on the strength of a few years in the Illinois state legislature and a, a year and a half in the Senate. Um, uh, but what did he do with this? You know, he um, essentially promoted neoliberal policies. Um, uh, he is, you know, the, Adolf Reed famously wrote about him in a village voice in 1995 when he was first le elected to the state legislature. And he said, you know, this is the, the new face of black politics in America is this, um, this slick neoliberal. And uh, Adolf turned out to be very um, uh, prescient in, in that diagnosis. Uh, but uh, the, um, uh, you know, just within what, three, four months of taking office, either he or somebody close to him called up Thomas Friedman and said, uh, we're looking forward to cutting entitlements, Social Security and Medicare at some point. We want to, you know, bring the budget back into balance. We are still, you know, uh, not out of the recession at that point, yet Obama had or was already thinking about um, uh, balancing the budget and cutting um, Social Security and Medicare. Uh, and now we see him more recently, you know, he had a lot to do with uh, getting, um, Bernie Sanders out of the race. Uh, uh, he had he actually talked the NBA out of striking. Um, yeah, he's just um, uh, he's no FDR, that's for sure. But you know, I think that the, the class difference is very interesting because you know FDR came out of the elite. FDR grew up on an estate with uh, I learned on a tour a couple of years ago with a staff of forty. You know, he grew up in great privilege uh, with great pedigree and great money, but that paradoxically gave him the courage to step on the toes of, of rich people to some degree. You know, he's famously said um, that rich people hate him and he welcomed their hatred. Uh, that is just the opposite of what Obama was all about. Obama grew up, you know, fairly modest background, uh, was basically groomed and adopted by rich people and he wanted their love uh, and, it, and it shows. And uh, which, like I said, it's disappointing because he has a lot of talent um, and he seems to have some knowledge and history uh, uh, on the left. Um, so in many ways that, you know, makes him um, more culpable than somebody who didn't know any better. I think uh, he went to a socialist scholars conference long ago. You know, he used socialism to pick up, what was it, ethereal long-legged bisexuals or something, whatever it was he said. Um, so yeah, um, he's very disappointing. Uh, but very effective in, in promoting um, the kind of neoliberal politics that the Democratic Party has been promoting for, um, for a long, long time and uh, blew an opportunity to remake our politics um, coming out of, of, of the Great Recession, uh, the way uh, Roosevelt uh, et al. Uh, remade our politics coming out of the Great Depression. Thank you. Thank you very much. There is a, another question uh, by Professor uh, Daniel Benson. Uh, this is high dog. Uh, assuming the Senate remains in Republican hands, blocking a political way out of the crisis as they, you described, do you see any hope in various social movements or grassroots organizing going on? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, one thing that's different now from the Obama years is that the left is much more um, active. Um, you know, we have DSA now with 85,000 members um, at last count. Um, you know, it was what 5,000 just a few years ago. Um, it's been a remarkable, and in New York, we um, had a whole lot of electoral victories, a lot of organizing victories um, with DSA and its allies and various coalitions. Uh, we're going to have, you know, a, so, like I said in the, in the talk, a socialist caucus in the state legislature, which is remarkable. Um, we have, you know, AOC in Congress, um, a, a figure of international standing. Um, just awful, you know, the, 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 the Black Lives Matter demonstrations over the summer, which were you know, dr driven at first by uh, protests against police violence, uh, had a very, you know, took on a much broader agenda as well. Um, uh, according to Gallup, about one in 10 American adults participated in the demonstration over the summer, which is just a remarkable number. Um, so yeah, there's just so much more consciousness. Uh, the younger generation, uh, the millennials and now the Zoomers uh, are showing a degree of political consciousness that I don't remember since, you know, at least the 60s or maybe further back than that. So yeah, that, that and just social movements active on, on so many, um, so many scores. I just interviewed somebody from my radio show who's involved in a movement in uh, 
New Orleans to uh, avert uh, budget cuts to the public library. They're going to take money away from the library and uh, use it in a gentrification slush fund. And uh, there was a big organization, um, a, a, a organizational effort to, to block that, and they won. Um, so yeah, there's uh, people in Maine, um, <clears throat> uh, people in DSA and around DSA have been did a wonderful job up there on uh, <clears throat> some um, uh, ballot propositions in Portland. So yeah, there's just an awful lot in the way of social movements going on. Uh, and um, you know, Gary Wills, this is something I've been thinking about for decades, but in, in his book, um, Nixon Agonistes, Gary Wills said the reason the 60s happened was that uh, in the 50s, people were so frustrated with Eisenhower that um, they said, oh, if we just get our guy in there, um, everything's gonna be better, everything's gonna be all right. So then JFK comes in office and everything was not that much better, you know? He's got, uh, and then people say, oh, maybe, maybe it's the system. And, you know, I, I think that, you know, with Trump now, um, there's been so much uh, focus on Trump, uh, who is, a, you know, just an appalling character. And I'm really happy to see him going away, assuming he does. Um, but, uh, you know, people, there's an awful lot of things wrong with this country that uh, are beyond Trump, precede Trump. Uh, and we'll follow Trump. And, you know, maybe people uh, see Biden and uh, maybe not that much is going to change. Uh, Biden, I see, is appointing some kind of ambassador to the right to serve his administration. He's not appointing any ambassador to the left to serve his administration. <clears throat> so there may be a great deal of disillusionment, which I think could be productive uh, for those social movements. Uh, people, when Obama took office, there was an awful lot of people who cut him a lot of slack. Uh, people projected all kinds of things onto him that turned out not to be uh, justified. Uh, I don't think people are feeling that with Biden and uh, we'll be relieved to get rid of Trump, but uh, uh, we're going to find out that a whole lot of things will change. And the only way they will is if uh, these social movements get active and, and larger and uh, have some optimism that will happen. Thank you very much. That's that's all the time we have. Uh, so let, I'm going to see if I can unmute everybody so that we can um, uh, how can, can I unmute you all? Uh, unmute you all so that we can applaud uh, Doug Henwood. Thank you so much. For Thank it. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and I will. Um, Thank you. Do, do, do. I will spiff up my text and send it to you please, tomorrow, Julio. Please, we will. Thank you. Fix it there. Thank you. Week. Thanks to all of you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. Thank you, bye.